Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining me. I'm really excited to uh, to have a few minutes together to talk about the evolution of serverless. And, and this topic is really, you know, geared to all the developers out there who are looking at, you know, how can they take advantage of the speed and power of cloud to help them solve, um, you know, interesting business challenges. You know, serverless computing has been around for a long time uh, in the cloud space. So serverless as a concept is not new. And it's rooted in a really simple idea, um, being able to focus on the application that you're building and automatically be able to take advantage of the scale, uh, the speed uh, of cloud uh, as part of building those applications. Uh, but serverless has evolved a lot, um, just like cloud has evolved a lot. You know, when cloud computing started, it was really about virtualized infrastructure, you know, compute storage and network. And as an application developer, you had to use that infrastructure to build up the entire stack that you needed to run your application. Install operating systems, uh, deploy frameworks and language runtimes, uh, set up uh, middleware and, and uh, development tools, uh, whatever was required uh, for you to build your application. Uh, and serverless uh, was a different approach that allowed you to really just focus on the code that you were writing, push that code to the cloud, uh, and have the cloud platform automatically handle the runtime environment, the routing of network traffic, the scaling and availability and security of that environment. Now, when serverless first came on the scene, I'll call that serverless 1.0, um, it was really focused on a pretty narrow definition of what the application could be. It was predominantly HTTP-based workloads. Um, it uh, uh, was kind of synonymous with this idea of stateless functions, meaning kind of small snippets of code that responded to an event uh, and processed that event. Um, there were limitations on execution time. It was hard to orchestrate across multiple uh, serverless functions. Um, it had a really limited kind of local development experience on your laptop, which is where most of us as developers uh, spend the majority of our time. Uh, so had a really a lot of really nice attributes around scaling and cost efficiency and simplicity, but came with a set of limitations that made it hard to leverage for a large class of workloads that were maybe more stateful, more data processing oriented, or just need to do you know um, you know more computation. Uh, over time, um, I've seen serverless start to evolve. And I think we're at a stage now where we have kind of a new generation of serverless ideas, a much broader view of serverless beyond functions that allows general purpose computation that removes a lot of those limitations, that enables more flexible processing, that starts to enable stateful workloads and, and, uh, and data heavy workloads. And so what I want to really talk about is what that new serverless looks like and, and kind of share with you some open source projects uh, and some new things that are coming along um, that I really think will expand what you can do with the notion of serverless in a cloud context. Now, before we go there, I think it's important to recognize that a lot of this evolution has been rooted in a uh, tremendous work that's been happening in the open source community. Um, you know, obviously over the last uh, four or five years, uh, the industry has uh, really consolidated around containers, particularly Kubernetes-based orchestration as the predominant platform um, that we develop applications on and deploy to. Um, but you know, Kubernetes is an incredibly flexible platform. You can run really literally any kind of application on it. Um, but it comes with a lot of concepts uh, and resources that you have to develop and manage. And there's a number of projects um, that have been growing up around Kubernetes that really are focused on then helping developers consume that platform more easily. Uh, projects like Knative, which make it easy to, to kind of teach Kubernetes how to deal with serverless workloads, scale to zero, handle event processing. Projects like Istio, which really tackle the kind of network connection between components and making those secure and visible. Uh, tools like Tecton and Paketo and Shipwright and others that really are focused on making it easy to to actually have a build process in front of that, uh, to start with source code and automatically build and run your application workload. And a lot of what's happening in serverless today is we're combining these, these capabilities together along with the underlying platform like uh, OpenShift and, and Kubernetes um, to build a kind of new runtime environment for serverless applications. 
At IBM, uh, you know, we've been uh, contributing to this journey over the last uh, six plus years, uh, both the overall evolution of cloud computing and the particular evolution of the notion of serverless within cloud computing. Um, you know, cloud has gone from physical servers to VMs to containers to PaaS application platforms like Cloud Foundry to serverless functions. And I think now we're at the point where we're really starting to think about serverless distributed applications in a much more general way. Um, IBM Cloud Code Engine is our um, latest serverless environment within IBM Cloud uh, that really builds upon this evolution that I'm talking about. It provides a environment that allows a developer to deploy a variety of different kinds of applications to a single common service that runs on top of a Kubernetes platform uh, without the developer having to worry about that, that Kubernetes environment, without having to manage that cluster. Um, the developer can simply focus on the application code that they want to deploy and run um, and have Code Engine manage that runtime environment on that stack. And those applications can be traditional serverless functions, but they can also be you know, web applications. They can be uh, batch processing workloads. They can be simple containers. They can be distributed data processing and machine learning. So the interface into Code Engine is really tailored for the different kinds of workloads that you might be able uh, want to be able to run, all while retaining this notion that the, the developer doesn't have to manage the runtime, only pays for what they're using, automatically scales based on the demands of the application, uh, automatically gets security and compliance applied to their environment. Um, so really allows them to kind of ignore the infrastructure to the right that really makes all this possible. So some of the examples I'm going to walk through of new things that are happening in the serverless space um, are uh, rooted in open source technologies, but are available in IBM Cloud um, through uh, systems like Code Engine. So let's talk through kind of six new things um, that are happening in the serverless space. Uh, in this kind of serverless 2.0 era. I'm going to talk about a couple of things you can do today. Um, a, a few things that I think are right around the corner. So they're available today in early forms. Uh, and then we'll take one sneak peek at where I think serverless might be going uh, and how it relates to new computing paradigms like quantum computing. So first, what can you do today? Uh, there's a couple of interesting things. You know, in my description of Code Engine, I talked about how you can use it to you know, run a simple application from source code or from a single container image, how you could write a batch process. But sometimes developers actually want to be able to consume the richer API of Kubernetes while not having to worry about how to run Kubernetes. And this is actually like uh, one of the challenges of any flexible platform like Kubernetes is not everyone wants to be exposed to all of the details involved in a Kubernetes environment. So with Code Engine, what we've enabled is because we've built our serverless platform on top of the Kubernetes environment, on top of uh, environments like OpenShift, you can actually move seamlessly between different layers of abstraction. I can just start with source code and push it to the cloud and not worry about anything. Maybe I'm comfortable building a container image so I can build the container image myself push that to a registry, and then just have Code Engine run the image for me so I don't have to worry about the execution environment for that image. And if I want to, I can actually drop down and start to access Kubernetes itself. So from an environment like Code Engine, I can kind of have a serverless Kubernetes environment, one where I don't have to worry about the cluster or the capacity of the cluster. I simply get pointed at a namespace within Kubernetes that I can use to deploy pods that I can configure Kubernetes resources inside of. Uh, the serverless environment of, uh, of Code Engine manages that environment for me, scales it as needed, scales it to zero if I'm not using it. And I simply get the benefits of working with a Kubernetes environment without having to worry about how to manage that, uh, that cluster and secure it properly. So I think this is one of the interesting things about serverless is the ability to retain the serverless consumption model while consuming the cloud at different layers uh, or with different levels of complexity. So that's something you can do today. Um, the other area where I see a lot of activity today around serverless is really the expansion of serverless from functions into kind of data and analytics workloads. Um, the word serverless, I, I think, can be applied to any service um, uh, deployed from, you know, accessible from the cloud where you as the end consumer don't have to worry about how to manage resources, hosts, and processes that you don't have to manage the infrastructure. 
Um, you know, things like object storage is an example of serverless storage. It's a big bucket that you can put data in and get data out without having to worry about um, how that resource is scaled and managed and, and how that data is preserved and protected and replicated. Uh, you simply have essentially a, what looks like a limitless storage pool for you to use. Code Engine itself and this, the Kubernetes example I gave is kind of an example of serverless runtimes, of having access to CPU resources to process your workload. Um, we have things in IBM Cloud like our SQL query service that really provide you with serverless query against data in places like object storage. So now I can actually do query against that data. I don't have to run a database. I don't have to load an index data. Uh, I don't have to pay for standing infrastructure for those query workloads. I can simply issue queries against data that I'm storing and get results. And I only pay for the data volume that I scan uh, and the results that I generate. Um, and you can even think about doing things like serverless Spark processing for doing analytics. So I can have access to a, a, a distributed parallel processing environment for doing Spark-based data analytics against data sources uh, and the Spark runtime environment itself can be exposed to me in a completely serverless way. Uh, that's something we offer as well on IBM Cloud that's built on top of capabilities like Code Engine and allows the developer to really deal with the world as a set of Spark jobs uh, and not have to worry about the infrastructure underneath. So those are two examples of things you can do today that really expand the notion of serverless from its kind of simpler functions-based roots. So, What's coming around the corner? So I think what's really exciting is that we're starting to see a number of frameworks that get closer to the language itself, and, and in particular, closer to Python, uh, and make it easy as a developer to build distributed applications, including stateful distributed applications, uh, using Python that can transparently take advantage of the scale of cloud by leveraging a service like Code Engine under the covers um, to be able to um, uh, do parallel processing and expand the computation pool that you have access to. Uh, one particularly interesting project is uh, Ray.io. Uh, Ray is a Python framework that allows you to build and run distributed applications. So it's really trying to tackle how do you make it easy for a developer to build a distributed application and to deal with communication and state uh, within that distributed application. It has some really interesting characteristics like a distributed in-memory object storage that is automatically made available to all the members of that distributed application. Uh, and with Ray, you can write really simple um, application logic. There's an example here on the slide on the right that allows you to declare a function as a remote uh, to execute that function. And it will run on the cloud and take advantage of hundreds of cores of resource uh, and, uh, and do that in a very transparent way. And when running on a serverless runtime like Code Engine, there's no standing infrastructure. It simply reaches out to the cloud, gets the resources it needs for its execution, and releases them when it's done. So Ray is an example of how languages are starting to be enhanced um, with the notion of serverless to make it easier for us to all build these data, AI, machine learning, and other kind of stateful distributed applications. Another example of a project in that realm is LithOps, uh, which is at LithOps.cloud. Uh, LithOps is, again, a Python framework. It's uh, slightly different. It's really designed to make it easy for a developer to transparently take uh, Python code that you might run on your laptop and execute it in parallel on the cloud. So instead of having a, you know, a 32 core developer machine, you wind up having a 200 core uh, you know, virtual machine in the cloud, if you will, that takes advantage of all of the scale of the cloud environment with, with very simple enhancements to uh, the application logic. So you really don't have to rewrite any of your code. You simply can wrap your code in some common Python constructs, uh, and it can be automatically delegated to a variety of backend environments, including systems like uh, Code Engine or direct to cloud infrastructure, uh, where now the developer can kind of transparently take advantage of hundreds of cores of compute uh, and have much quicker response times on the data that they're processing or on the computation that they're doing uh, in a really simple way. So LithOps and Ray are both examples of how languages are evolving with the notion of serverless to take advantage of cloud um, for developers in a really uh, simple language paradigm. 
One of the other new things that's coming, uh, uh, which I find really interesting, is this uh, Super CLI project. Uh, the idea here is that as a developer, we kind of start most of our development on our local machine. So we kind of have our laptop, if you will, that we think of as our development environment. And the thought experiment with Super CLI was like, what if we could keep that single computer paradigm, but we had essentially infinite capacity? It was like a, a supercomputer that I had access to, but I could treat it like a single computer. And in Linux, you know, we have a long heritage of the hardening of kind of Linux commands and Linux pipes as a way to do processing. There's an example on the right where I, I cat a file and I unzip it and I grep for some content and I sort and, and uh, find unique elements. And doing that against a local file is easy. But what if I wanted to do that against a very large file and I wanted to do that in a parallel way across lots of resources? Um, how could I do that but still keep the same local experience? And that's what Super CLI does. So I can, I can run a set of local Unix commands against a data source that lives in object storage. Um, and I can automatically take advantage of the scale of the cloud um, to be able to do that processing. So that's a really exciting project. I think go check out Super CLI at, super at soup.run. Um, and it, uh, it'll give you a good sense of how serverless is enabling this kind of transparent adoption of the uh, cloud at scale. One more example um, of, uh, of what's going on in the evolution of serverless, and this is now a little farther out. And as many of you are aware, uh, IBM is a leader in quantum computing. Uh, we recently announced uh, new quantum systems um, that are you know, larger 127 qubit systems. Um, if you really start to think about though, how quantum computing applications will come into the real world, many applications that use quantum will actually wind up being a mix of quantum computing and classical computing. You might use classical computing to do pre-processing uh, of data to, to set up the quantum uh, environment that you wanted to execute. You'll then delegate part of that uh, application to the quantum system. And then you might do some post-processing on a classical computer uh, to take the results uh, and aggregate them and format them for consumption. And so mixing quantum and classical computing, we think, will be a really common pattern. Um, serverless is actually a really nice model for enabling that mixing to be seamless. Uh, and we have other examples that are kind of like this. Like if you think about GPUs today, you know, most GPU applications are actually a mix of CPU-based workload and GPU-based workload. And you, you kind of mix CPU and GPU-based things very naturally. Well, one of the things we're doing at IBM is we have a project called QuizKit, which allows you to express quantum logic in a Python-based format. Uh, and we're enabling QuizKit uh, with serverless computing using platforms like Code Engine to allow you to easily mix. So I could write one program like the one on the left that does some pre-processing uh, that will get delegated via Code Engine onto classical computing in the cloud. Um, then I can have some quantum function that gets run uh, code engine will send that to the quantum system for execution, and then I can do some post-processing uh, again back on classical. So I think serverless may become the dominant paradigm for how we actually start to build the first generation of quantum workloads because it allows the developer to have a really seamless model for how you can mix together these classical and quantum elements into one application. So hopefully that gives you uh, a, a sense for what's going on. I think there's immense potential in the serverless space. I think it's really changed from its roots as a kind of functions-based, you know, stateless um, workload uh, on the cloud to something that now can handle uh, large-scale data computation, AI machine work learning workloads, uh, and large-scale compute workloads in really simple ways. Uh, if you want to learn more, I encourage you to go uh, check out uh, Code Engine on IBM Cloud. Uh, and thank you so much.